<laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, about the only time I come to New York is uh, to the Saratoga sale or to the races here at Saratoga, although I've done some work for Mallory Mort and for Vivian and for Newtown Anner Stud here, and it, it's always uh, uh, a treat to come up here. I, I was saying last night that, and I believe this, I, I'm a Texan. I, I grew up in Texas, not in Kentucky, so I don't bleed blue. Um, and I've always had the philosophy that if you do due diligence, that you can raise a good horse anywhere on the planet. Uh, we have some advantages, perhaps, in Kentucky that some places they don't. It's more difficult for us to make a mistake. But I really, truly believe that if you, if you, if you do the math, if you do due diligence, if you respond to your environment, that there's no reason that you can't raise a good horse anywhere. And I think the, the proof is in the pudding. The California chrome was raised on Harris ranches in California, where I do nutrition. Uh, Lawadas Animo was raised by one of my big clients, uh, Gonzalo Torrealba in Brazil. Uh, you can go on and on and on about horses that are raised in what are not to be the perceived meccas of, of the thoroughbred business, but by horsemen that are able to respond to, 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 the, to the hand that they have been given environmentally, make adjustments and, and raise a good horse. Uh, well, people say, well, why, why are so many good horses raised in Kentucky? It's easy because we probably got the 10 best stallions on the planet and we got probably 30,000 of the best mares and that makes it easier percentage wise to, to raise a good horse. But one of my big clients now is, is Three Chimneys Farm and we're very excited about a horse that we just got called Sharp Azteca. And I think he was raised somewhere north of uh, Kentucky. Uh, and, and so uh, I truly believe that if you, if you take the hand that you're dealt uh, and, and are good horsemen, there's no reason that you can't raise good, good horses anywhere. So I don't bleed blue. Uh, I didn't drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, I, I, I drank some Texas Kool-Aid. But they said when they kicked me out of Texas and I went to Kentucky that it raised the average IQ of both states. So <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't lose anything in Texas either. So anyway, we'll get started. And what I'd like to do is, as we're going through here, if, if you have a, a question, a burning question, and I, I'll be glad to answer it, or we'll have some time between, this is in two parts. Um, I'll have some time between the two parts that we can discuss questions that, that you might have. So I entitled this Equine Nutrition a short course, but I'm afraid it's going to be equine nutrition a long course so hopefully you can can stay awake let's see if this thing works i made a solemn vow a long time ago that i wouldn't ever talk about nutrition that i didn't start first talking about forages and the importance of forage in a horse's diet and if you consider it horses evolved as wandering herbivores continuous grazers uh, they're equipped with a functional cecum that houses millions, billions of bacteria and protozoa that help them digest cellul uh, cellulose, or fibrous feeds. And uh, they weren't designed as, as meal feeders. Uh, and we, in all of our wisdom, have decided that, no, we're going to put this horse in a 12 by 12 box stall and feed him breakfast and dinner like we eat. And so consequently, we probably have caused some problems for ourselves that are needless problems. So remember that, that they evolved to eat uh, forages, fibrous feeds. Uh, and if, if we keep that in mind, and we keep in mind the importance of the hindgut uh, of this horse, of the cecum, and understand that keep, keeping that cecum and large colon and the microbial flora of the hindgut healthy uh, we're going to prevent a lot of problems, then you're away. I mean, all you have to do then is uh, adjust to, to some environmental conditions that I'll talk to you about. The other thing about nutrition, uh, this is kind of my Bible. Uh, it's, it's called The Nutritional Requirements of Horses. It's published by the National Research Council. 
Uh, the last time we revised it was in 2007. We're th talking about a new uh, revision. And when you consider nutrition, you, you either have to buy into the fact that different horses have different nutrient requirements or not. And if you don't believe that they have specific nutrient requirements, then you can probably go back up and eat some breakfast rolls and because you're not gonna believe what I have to say. But I believe that based on all of the research that we've done and based on a lot of practical stuff that we've learned on farms and raising horses that, that we're relatively close to many of the nutrient requirements of horses. And so nutrition is, is, uh, of horses is a science uh, and it, it's an art. And I always say that it doesn't matter what kind of a rocket scientist I am sitting in front of a computer formulating a diet, if the people that are going to use it aren't good enough horsemen, it ain't going to work. All right? So it's, that's the art part of it, of being able to, uh, I always say, the eye, of the eye of the master fattens the ox, or the eye, eye of the master fattens the horse. So what we have to do is we have to translate these numerical requirements into a practical feeding program that we know allow us to get the growth and development and performance that we want. But all of it's based on this, uh, on, on the, the NRC. So safe, effective feeding programs for horses should be forage based. And, and I'll talk to you more about some of the forages that we use and what the nutrient uh, value of those forages are, but if you base your program on forages and only feed them enough grain, hard to feed, to meet requirements over and above those received by the horse from forage, then, then you're going to be pretty safe. You're going to be a lot better off. Is that what we do? No, probably not. You know, probably what we do is that we feed horses certain amounts of grain and many times consider the forage as gravy, as just fiber, as bulk, as scratch factor. And why do we do that? Because it's easy for me to feed a horse four pounds feed in the morning and four pounds feed at night, and I know how much he got, and I know how, how much he ate, and it's more difficult for me to, to project or to calculate, to estimate the amount of forage that a horse is going to eat and then do the mathematics the other way. So, you know, by convention, I think a lot of people do it upside down is they feed grain and then they say, well, I need to feed some hay too, or they need to feed some pasture too. Uh, so start with, with a, a forage base. Uh, so the, hard, the amount of hard grain or hard, hard feed, which is a kind of a European term, uh, should only be that amount that is necessary over and above what is provided by the basal forage diet. Now, you're not going to do this math all the time, but you are going to do this math intuitively if you make a commitment to use forage as, as part of the, the main part of the diet that you're feeding. And this is, this is not just for horses on the, uh, on, on the farm. It's also for horses on the racetrack. It's event horses, it's polo ponies, it doesn't matter what kind of horse it is. Is that if, if you'll try to emphasize fiber, em emphasize quality hay, quality forage, uh, you you're going to stay out of trouble a lot. So the forages that we're talking about include permanent pasture. And you're in a, even though it's pretty cold up here, we have cold in Kentucky too. You, relative to forages, whether uh, relative to the grasses that you use, or you're the same we are. They're cool season grasses. All right, all of these cool season grasses are high in quality. So you have cool and warm season grasses, and warm season grasses characteristically are lower in quality than cool season grasses. So we're talking predominantly about bluegrass, orchard grass, reed canary grass, brome grass, some varieties of fescue uh, as being high quality grasses that grow vigorously in the cool seasons like the spring and, and they have another vigorous growth phase in the fall. And they're characterized by being uh, 
very high quality. Uh, seasonal pasture. Uh, I used to do a lot of work in Argentina when Gonzalo had mares in Argentina. And in Argentina, they uh, were infested by the blight called uh, fescue. And they had a lot of problems with fescue toxicosis uh, because of the endophyte in, in, in fescue, which causes agalactia and prolonged gestation and difficult births and so on. So they didn't know how to handle this. So basically, they plowed it all up. They, they do have areas where they have a lot of poi pretensis, which is the scientific name for bluegrass. But they plowed all this stuff up, and they replaced it with seasonal pasture. And so part of the year, they grazed oats. They planted oats as a crop and grazed it. And part of the year, they grazed soybeans. And so you'd have, have a big soybean field out there, and these mares uh, in yearlings and foals were grazing these soybean plants, and then in the other part of the year, oats. So there are some seasonal pastures that we can use. Typical, uh, typically, we don't here because permanent pasture is is more of what we're used to. Um, hay and haylage, and when you get to hay, and I'm a, you know, my my attitude about if you want to improve your nutrition program, the kind of horse you raise, probably factor one is buy better hay and feed more of it. So I'm a, I'm a hay feeder, all right? And I use mixed hays, mixed grass, legume hays predominantly. We see all, all other kinds of small grain hays like out in, out in the West, especially for people who have been taught that alfalfa hay is poison. They feed sorry old oat hay uh, instead of good alfalfa. Uh, but there are many different options that we have depending our, on where you are. I grew up in Texas and Florida. My dad was the extension horse specialist in Florida, and we fed coastal Bermuda hay all my life and never had a problem with it. But if you're in Florida, a lot of people say that coastal causes horses to colic and they don't want to feed coastal. So they import TNA, Timothy and alfalfa mixed hay, uh, and pay double the price for it. So there are a lot of different options that you have for, for forage, and it depends on where you are. You know, like if you look at Maryland, Virginia, Kentucky, Ohio, uh, the Oregon, uh, the Northwest, Japan, uh, they're probably predominantly bluegrass or orchard grass or a mix of bluegrass and orchard grass is what they tend to feed, cool season grasses. Very, very high quality. Uh, they don't take a lot of overgrazing, but horses really thrive. It's like in the, in the springtime when grass starts to grow again, I'll tell people, you know, this year will be fine. Don't shove on him. Uh, he'll be good when Dr. Green comes in April. And because, I mean, they turn inside out uh, on these on these high quality forages, which, which which they're supposed to. Historically, I have been a little bit reluctant to feed silage or haylage, and the reason I have is because when you make silage or haylage, as you know, you use an anaerobic process, and and the microbial flora that are normal in in the the, the preserved hay, uh, when you take away oxygen anaerobically, they digest some of the starch and they make uh, volatile fatty acids and propionic acid, butyric acid. Um, and these products then are, um, you know, very, you know, when you smell them, you know, if you smell silage, you'll never forget it. And that's typically from propionic acid and butyric acid. So acetic, propionic, and butyric acid are normal organic acids produced in the hind gut of the horse when they digest fiber. So that's, that's no big issue. The problem comes that if you, if you puncture the, the wrapper, like, you know, most haylage fed to horses is wrapped, so it's anaerobic fermentation, then you can get some molds. Uh, if you bail up a uh, rat or a rabbit or a raccoon or a cat, uh, you know, you can get spoiled silage that can kill a horse. So I've, I've always been a little bit reluctant about it. If you put it upright, and, and that's the if, 
um, it's good horse feed. You know, to give you an example, Darley in Japan and Darley in England uh, both probably use more haylage than they use dry hay, and the horses do fabulous on it. But there's always this question in the back of my mind is, is, is there something in there um, that, that's going to hurt a horse? So you just have to, be, you have to be careful. Now, in areas like I've just described in Ireland, you, know, you, you may not have three days in a row in the year that it doesn't rain. You know? So if hay baling conditions are bad, uh, then it may be the only way you can save hay. And, and it, it's good horse feed. It's not better. I, I think horses relish the taste of it if, if it's put up right. But it, it's certainly acceptable. It has the same nutrient characteristics as the crop that you put up. So if you put up uh, ryegrass hay as haylage, it has the same nutritive value as ryegrass. Um, it precludes, if it's done right, mold. And a lot of molds, I don't suggest that horses are fed moldy feed, but a lot, of, a lot of the molds that are produced really are innocuous to the, to the horse. The, the thing that probably worries me the most about it is botulism, you know, of getting a dead animal or something in or spoiling the deal. So if, you, if you'll cull that or feed it to cattle or whatever, it's fine. A guy came over here about 10 years ago and he was going to revolutionize the fiber industry in the U.S. by introducing haylage. It didn't get off the ground. And why did it not get off the ground? Because characteristically, we can make good hay. You know, we have the curing conditions. This year was kind of an adventure because we had too much rain and it was difficult to, to make hay. You can also use uh, propionic acid or a mixture of, of propionic acid and acetic acid to spray on the hay when it goes into the baling chamber. And bale, I've baled hay experimentally uh, up to 30% moisture and it didn't mold because of the propionic acid. And if you go home tonight, unless you're organic and look on your bread package, you'll see sodium propionate or propionic acid and it's a very potent mold inhibitor. So we have used these chemicals uh, to spray on hay. So you know, I usually like to, to have 13% max moisture when I, I bale hay to, to think I really don't get mold. But I can bale it a much higher than that. And up in some areas, they use a lot of probe on, on hay. And I, I tell people, you know, faced with the choice of having a little propionic acid on my hay or having a moldy hay, I'll take the probe every day. But people have an aversion to putting stuff on their chemicals on their hay. So it, it, uh, a lot of people do it and just don't say they do it. So haylage is good if it's put up right. Nutritionally, it's fabulous. Uh, but there are some caveats involved with how it's put up and keeping it in a anaerobic state all the way through. Thank you. Um, more than one way to skin a cat. You know, that I want to tell you one way, maybe several ways, but just because I don't, that's not the way I like it, doesn't mean that it's not effective when used properly, and haylage falls in that category, and I have clients that use it a lot. Uh, so if you look at cool season grasses, I've kind of already mentioned them, uh, bluegrass, uh, ryegrass, Italian ryegrass, Timothy, orchard grass, brome, reed canary, tall fescue. All of these forages have different uh, nutritive characteristics or palatability characteristics. If I'm establishing a horse pasture, I usually use uh, predominantly, if, if agronomically, I'm in an area where I can, I use predominantly bluegrass, orchard grass, and a little annual rye as a nurse crop. And then I'll come in and maybe put some white Dutch clover uh, over seeded after I get it done. And when I renovate pastures, uh, using a tie drill or a brilliant or some kind of a, a, a no-till drill, 
I use like a 60-40 mixture of bluegrass and orchard grass because those are the grasses that I think horses find most palatable. If you want to know what's palatable, go out in your pasture. And the places where the horses are grazing are the grasses they like. And you go to other areas. And typically, we don't have very many monocultures in here. Our, our, we have swords of pasture that are a mixture, unlike... Ireland is predominantly monocultures of ryegrass, so they don't have any choice. It's kind of like if you don't like mushrooms and we're having mushrooms, then you're going to get hungry. If you don't like ryegrass, that's one in the pasture, so you're going to get hungry. Whereas here, I think that we use a little greater variety of forages that have different positive characteristics. Uh, and I think that if you go out in 90% of the horse pastures and it's a mixture of bluegrass and orchard grass and fescue, that you're gonna find that the horses are using the bluegrass. That's what they prefer. And so that's what I like to plant. I like to plant, I don't wanna reinvent the wheel. And I'm, I'm an absolute anti-fescue person of any kind. You know, we have had lots of problems in Kentucky with Kentucky 31 tall fescue that has an endophyte in it, uh, epichloetianum, uh, that is toxic. And you, you, you can kind of deny this all you want, but after you have lost your fourth or fifth or sixth or second foal because of a dystocia or a neonatal asphyxia or your mare didn't milk or you have tough, thick placentas and you have red bag where the placenta comes first and, and, and they don't have, they die of asphyxiation or their dummy folds and you finally decide, I need to get rid of this damn stuff. And they have some new fescues out that have, they've replaced it, replaced that endophyte with another that they th don't think is toxic. But what I tell my clients is don't get, don't drink the Kool-Aid. You know they eat orchard grass and bluegrass and Timothy. Why take a chance? If, you, if you're going to spray a pasture with Roundup and start over, use palatable grasses that historically we know horses do good on and, and not some of these novel fescues that, that they come out with, my opinion anyway. So there are a lot of ways, a lot of cool season grasses, and uh, I, I would say that uh, bluegrass is a, is a is a sod forming grass. It spreads by rhizomes under the ground, whereas orchard grass is a bunch grass, like fescue is a bunch grass, and it's good in a way because, like in in fescue, it, because it doesn't spread under the ground like bluegrass. If you spray it, you kill it. Uh, it's gone. Uh, it takes a long time for it maybe to come back. So bluegrass makes that dense, dense uh, sward of grass that's good underfoot. Uh, and if you don't overgraze it, it it's, a, it's a fabulous grass. It doesn't do well in hot, in, in the heat of the summer. Um, you know, it'll go dormant a little bit, and, and orchard grass less so. So if you try to select grasses that have an extended growing season, then you're gonna have better pastures throughout the summer. Warm season pastures, and I guess I probably could just skip this, but you might as well know about it while you're here. Uh, the predominant ones used in Florida are Pensacola Bahia, or Pangola grass, some African star, a lot of improved pastures are coastal Bermuda or some cultivar of Bermuda grass. Tifton, uh, you see a lot. Uh, these, these are, you go down to Florida and you look out across the pasture and you got cows out in that pasture in belly deep grass and they're starving to death. You know, that, it, it's a different deal. The quality of these forages is just different. So if you try to feed horses in Florida like we feed them in Kentucky or like you feed them in New York, you're going to be very disappointed in your results. And that's predominantly because of the basic nutritional quality of the forage that they use. And so the cool season grasses can't survive down there. All right, it's too hot. So all of these warm season grasses are used across, across the southeast and across Texas and into New Mexico, 
uh, for different pastures. So these are lower quality. I mean, they do give you some nutritional value. Some of the pastures down there, rather than being pastures, are probably better characterized as gymnasiums. Uh, in terms of how much nutritional value they're getting. But these cool season grasses can be very, uh, I mean, warm season grasses can be used as pasture. If you look at hay, which is basically cured uh, pasture or, or hay, Timothy has been kind of the uh, traditional uh, horse hay. And I, I've actually never understood that because the nutritional value of Timothy is, is marginal at best to me. I mean, if you look at some really good Timothy hay, it can be 8 and 9% protein. And they use it on the racetrack a lot. You know, they're hanging a big bag of feed in front of them all the time. But if you compare it nutritionally to a mixed alfalfa orchard grass or a alfalfa hay from a nutrition standpoint, it, it doesn't, doesn't come close. And one of the things, just to digress, that I do when I go to a, to a racehorse stable, uh, if I have trouble with ulcers or colic and, and so on, is I replace a lot of the Timothy hay with a mixed legume grass hay. Uh, it's higher in digestible energy, and then by definition, you have to feed less grain. So if, if you actually look at the chemical characteristics of this hay, it's in compared Timothy to a lot of grasses or mixed grass legume haze is not close. And you're lucky because you got a little place called the, uh, the DHIA, which is the Dairy Herd Improvement Association, Dairy One in Ithaca, New York, 730 Warren Road, that I think is one of the best analytical labs on the planet for feeds and forages. So you're just down the road. It's in I think Ithaca is in New York, isn't it? Is that close to Cornell? Um, so, so anyway, if if you if you have want to, I, I was talking to Mr. Gallo just before we started. It's amazing to me the number of farms that have historic res records going back 30 years on soil analysis that have never taken a pasture analysis, a pasture sample. You know, so they're going to let somebody talk them into putting two tons an acre of, of lime or putting nitrogen fertilizer on their pastures and, and making the pH right and everything. But my horses don't eat dirt. They eat grass. So I'm going to spend that, my money on, on forage samples. And you can, you can do it one of two ways. You can do, use the old traditional, the one I've used for years, uh, uh, called a, um, it's, it's package number 10, and basically what it is is it's, it's protein, fiber, ADF, NDF, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, copper, zinc, manganese for 38 bucks at Dairy One, or you can use Equi Analytical. And what is the difference in the cost in those Equi Analytical and the uh, general sample, equi. And that's a key word because that makes it twice as valuable to you if you send it in there. So I always start with just the basic kind of analysis for 38 bucks. And, and then if I really want to get fancy or if I got a client that wants to be fancy and wants to spend money, I use equi analytical and I use the trainer package, which gives me starch uh, so, uh, non-structural carbohydrates, uh, a few other little things that, that people sometimes are interested in using. But, but I would, it's, it's easy. You know, you, you send a package up there on Monday, you got the result on Thursday or Friday. It's a very good lab. Uh, Paul Shroy managed it for years, and, and they're good. And you can get a, a hay core there you know, that you hook to a drill and drill and make the deal. They've got instructions on the internet, um, www.dairy1.com. Uh, they've got an incredible, yes? Best time of year to do a uh, forage analysis. Uh, there are best times. One is that you're, you're more concerned with analyzing the grass than the snow. So that kind of 
gives you a little bit of a deal. But I would say that early May and then again in August, September are, would be the best time. And, you know, a lot of, we've done on some farms that I do work on, we've done like four samples over each season just to see how much seasonal variation there is. Uh, and, and it's interesting uh, because in General Animal Science 101, I learned um, back in the late 1800s that uh, forages have more calcium than phosphorus and grains have more phosphorus than calcium. That's a given. Only problem is the plants have forgotten that. And so what you find is that in areas that have really rapidly growing cool, se cool season grasses, that you'll actually have an inverted calcium phosphorus ratio in, in the pasture, which I think can cause us some problems because if in the total diet you have more calcium, uh, more phosphorus than calcium, then there is a problem or can be a problem with nutritional secondary hyperparathyroidism or big head disease, Miller's disease, uh, where the animal is, is taking calcium out of the skeleton to maintain plasma calcium levels uh, and it can cause some lameness problems. So characteristically what I do, even when the pastures are glorious looking, uh, then I'll probably supplement with some extra calcium now uh, in the spring and the fall to account for the fact that, that we have these inversions. And, and it's for a long time people didn't, you know, if they sent a lab sample off and the grass came back higher in phosphorus than calcium, they said the, the lab screwed up because that's not the way it is. But I've done enough of them to know that it is the way it is. And so even in Australia where there are a lot of irrigated pasture, where these pastures are driven by water, we get these inversions and you have to be careful of, about getting enough calcium in the diet. If you're feeding alfalfa hay, it's fixed because alfalfa hay is 1.5% calcium and about 0.4% phosphorus. So we d have done it across the year to see if there is adequate reason for us to adjust formulas during the year for some of these customs, like you would a TMR or a dairy ration, uh, and, and have basically decided that if they'll feed what they're supposed to feed, how they're supposed to feed it. It's not necessary that we have a spring ration and a fall ration and a winter ration. So, uh, in certain times, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Grow and win and, and similar are typically about 4% calcium and 2% phosphorus. Okay, so two, two to one ratio, but it's 4% calcium. So that means if you feed a kilo of it, and let me get on my soapbox. I wish we could get to where we use the metric system, uh, but obviously we're not gonna get there. I, I think they've come closest in Mississippi because I saw a sign on a store down there that it said Coke in two liter bottles, 299, L-E-A-D-E-R. So they understand metric pretty good. Uh, but it, it's so, so much easier mathematically uh, to, to deal with because you can do all the calculations in your head. So if you're feeding two kilos or 2.2 pounds, so that's 40 grams of calcium and 20 grams of phosphorus. And, and that's gonna make up the difference. It's, it's gonna, and better if you're feeding a little alfalfa hay or legume hay, which is one and a half percent calcium and 0.4, depending on where it's grown, that's close, uh, then that also is gonna help you. But if you, if you just say these pastures are great, kick them out on pasture with nothing, you can get some nutrient imbalance and deficiencies as I'll talk about here in just a second. So the legume hays, uh, if we look at legumes, probably across the world, the most commonly used legume hay is alfalfa. They call it lucerne in uh, Australia. Um, we call it alfalfa. When I first came to Central Kentucky, 
75, there was a lot of red clover used. Uh, you can't, it's hard to find red clover hay anymore. And the other thing is, is that they have this rhizoctonia that causes uh, salivating disease, slobbering disease. I remember the first time I ever saw it, I had a little place out on Mount Horeb Pike and I came in and they had webbins on the stalls and all my mares had, because you know, having horses is a terminal disease and so, even all the way through graduate school, I had horses and I'd go up and I'd get up in the morning earlier than you're supposed to, to go feed and everything. So I was feeding this red clover hay and I walked in the barn and it was like river. I thought, oh my God, all my damn horses have, have, have rabies, you know, because they're slobbering all over the place. So it does have this rhizoctonia that can cause excessive salivation. And so I, I typically don't use it. But I remember John Williams, and anybody who's been in the horse business long knows John. Um, he, he was a Red Clover fan when he was at Spendthrift, uh, oh, a long, many years ago. But you don't see it much anymore. You just don't see it very much at all. Lespedeza, you can use Lespedeza hay. Again, you don't see it very much. The, probably the most frequently used is, is uh, alfalfa or lucerne. You can use bird's foot trefoil. Uh, it's a legume. Uh, we, well, I don't see it much, uh, simply because, I don't know why simply because. Uh, same with, with Lespedeza. You know, you just don't, you don't see it, but you can. There are lots of different hay crops you can use. You can use uh, um, oats. It's not a legume. You can use soybean hay. Uh, in, the, in Florida, they make some soybean hay. It's a legume. It's fairly high quality. Uh, when I get to hay, personally, I like a like 60-40 mix of orchard grass and alfalfa. If I can't get it, I go toward alfalfa instead of straight grass. And the reason I, I like it is not so much from a nutritionist standpoint as it is from a mechanics standpoint. It seems like if you have a mixture of orchard grass and alfalfa, that, that they cut that hay such that the, timoth that the uh, alfalfa is not as stemmy. And if you feed stemmy hay and you're paying $300 a ton for it, what are you actually paying for that hay? At my house, you're paying $600 a ton because the damn horses aren't going to eat the stems. All right, so if they're only eating 50% of the hay that you put out, it makes it pretty expensive. And I find if I try to find a mixture, uh, a soft hay, if you will, uh, a mixture of orchard grass and alfalfa, uh, that the horses eat more of it because I think that the alfalfa plant is cut at an earlier stage of maturity. And if you look at hay, regardless of if it's alfalfa or timothy or orchard grass or coastal Bermuda, the biggest factor that's going to affect nutritional quality is the maturity of that plant when it was cut, all right? Because the plant has one role in life, and that is to produce a seed. And the more mature they get, and the seed is sitting on a stalk, the more lignified they become, and lignin is a component of the forage that is not digestible, period, none, not a net, none. Now, cellulose we can digest, lignin we can't digest. And so the more mature the plant becomes, the more highly lignified and the more indigestible. There are some plants, like alfalfa hay, when you go past 10% bloom, you lose a percent and a half per day in digestibility. I remember when, when I bought my farm in Nunsuch, it was in the midst of a bunch of cattle farms. And so being a good neighbor and a professor, and I wanted to spread the knowledge that I had, so I began to tell my cattle farmer neighbors that, look, if, if you'd cut this hay, it would uh, it'd make it a lot stronger nutritionally. You know, you, the digestibility of this stuff would be a lot better. They'd say, yeah, but I wouldn't make as many rolls. And I said, yeah, but the rolls that you made would make up for the higher number of rolls when you cut it too late. Well, all I know is it beats hell out of snowballs in the wintertime, and away they'd go. 
But maturity is critical, critical, it's, and especially for legume haze. Uh, it, the, the more mature it is, the less digestible, the less it's worth to you uh, in dollars and cents and to the horse in terms of nutritive value. Small grain haze, we don't use them a lot. In California, they use them a lot. Oat hay, wheat hay, peanut hay in Florida. Uh, and, and one of the reasons they do is that they've been told that alfalfa is, is toxic. If it is, all of my horses for many, many years would have been dead uh, because I'm an alfalfa fan. Uh, it's, and I'm especially, as I said, a fan uh, of alfalfa when it's mixed with a grass hay because it makes it more palatable, I think. If you feed a flake of Timothy in one corner and a flake of alfalfa in the other corner, which one are they probably going to eat first? Alfalfa, I mean, they're going to vacuum the damn stuff, all right? And I think it's a great crop. It's like 2.24 megacalories per kilo in digestible energy, whereas Grass haze are about 1.4. So you've got 0.6 megacalories per kilo increase in energy that they get from it. It's higher in protein, isn't it? Alfalfa hay ranges from 15 to 22% protein. Grass hay ranges from, depending on fertility, from 8 to 11. Uh, calcium we've talked about. Vitamin A is much higher. So in terms of nutritional bang for your buck, you're getting a lot out of legume hay. Now, the other part of that story is the recent work done at Texas A&M says that alfalfa hay for horses in training is not just palliative, but also pre preventative of ulcers. So you get horses in a stressful situation and you have problem with egus, and you're like me, I can't afford gastroguard, uh, then I'd, at 45 bucks a day, I'd, I feed a mixed legume hair. If I got a filly that doesn't want to eat, you know, I'd, for me, for racehorses, if you can't keep their head in the tub, you can't train them, uh, most of them will eat alfalfa hay. So I use it as a tool on the racetrack particularly, uh, to, to help horses eat and because of the positive research that's been done in terms of its effect on, on ulcers. It's high in calcium, so it makes sense. Uh, why would hay in general help a horse in terms of ulcers? The, the, the main way you buffer acids uh, in the stomach is that you chew. Uh, we do, they do, uh, and the more they chew, uh, the more sodium bicarbonate they're going to, the more saliva they're going to produce, and the more sodium bicarbonate they're going to produce to buffer stomach acids. So it only makes sense that when you're looking at, at horses that are under stress and probably incorrectly fed anyway, that the more fiber you give them, um, the better they're going to do. There was a study done years ago by Skip Hintz, who, if you've been around here for a long uh Dr. Hentz was kind of one of the pioneers in nutrition at Cornell. And they went to a lot of racetracks and they did kind of a, a clinical research study. And they found that the average feed intake for horses on the racetrack was six kilos of feed, which is, I think, 13 pounds, and six kilos of hay, 50-50. And sometimes you have to go a little bit stronger with the grain for a big stout colt that's in hard training. So. The, the forage part of it, again, another reason because of the salivation and so on, that it's important. You want to make a horse drink? Feed him fiber. Why does it make him drink? You don't feed him popcorn or salt. It, it make, he, he drinks because if he's salivating a lot, this reduces plasma volume and it stimulates thirst. So there are a lot of reasons, again, going back to... Uh, uh, to use in forages that are important. So, I said early that the reason that we don't start with forage and then top up with hay is because we don't know how much horse eats. How much you think a horse, uh, forage a horse will eat? It varies a little bit, but if you use a general average of two and a half to three percent of their body weight per day in forage dry matter, 
you're pretty well going to nail it. Two and a half to three percent of body weight per day in forage dry matter. I meant to change that first. Uh, so it's going to vary. It's going to vary depending on a, a lot of factors, but it, it's going to vary. So what we, what we think, I may have to put on my glasses here, uh, two and a half to three percent, two and a half to three and a half percent of dry matter. What is dry matter? That's the feed with the water taken out, okay? So hay is typically about 88% dry. That means there's 12% uh, moisture in it, even though it doesn't look like there's moisture. Grains are typically 88 to 90% dry matter. Straits, oats, corn, barley are usually about 90% dry matter. All right, so if you look at that then for a, um, let me go back to kilos and I'll try to translate it. So 2.5% of body weight for a 500 kilo horse is 12.5 kilos a day uh, of dry matter. So just multiply by two to make the math easy, and that's about 25 pounds, isn't it? Somewhere close to that. Uh, 3.5 is 17.5 kilos of hay. So you, if you do the math on a really good quality forage, you're getting up close where you're meeting the DE value, the DE requirements for most horses. All right. Now, if you look at fresh pasture, that converts to at 80% moisture, 20% dry. That means that those mares are, are weanlands or whatever. A 500 kilo, 1100 pound horse is eating 62 kilos of fresh grass a day. 62 to 87 kilos. So just multiply it by two to make it palatable to you, no pun intended. Um, 130 pounds of fresh grass they, they, a 500 kilo horse would eat. So if you went out with little clippers and clipped 130 pounds and piled it up here, it's a pretty mountainous uh, kind of a pile, isn't it? To, to put it in perspective of what they actually can eat. Uh, some of them don't get that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, it's right. right. It translates into if you do, and I'll get to that more in a minute, if you do what we probably should do, it's more hay than most of the speed, basically. All right, so there are a lot of factors then are going to affect this forage intake. We know that they're prodigious consumers of forage. All right, one is availability. Horse people are most, are, are, are characteristically similar. And like I have, when I go to a horse sale, I have this terrible disease called raise your handitis. And I'm, you know, if I bring another horse home, I'm, I'm probably gonna lose 50% of everything I own because my wife's gonna leave. So sometimes our pastures are gymnasiums instead of sources of nutrients because we overstock, don't we? Uh, most of the time. We don't, you know, I'm not Sheikh Mohammed. I may look like him, I kind of favor him, but um, I don't have 10 acres per horse. That, that I have 10 horses per acre. So there's a little bit of a difference in availability of forage. And also in this kind of weather, the availability of forage is basically what you give them, isn't it? And even, even in Kentucky when we don't have snow-covered pastures, the amount of available forage for those horses is limited. Now, if you, if you go sample the green stuff, it's good feed. There's just not very much of it because it's not replenishing. Uh, it, and if you try to do some stockpile some forage like we would some cattle, it helps, you know, because 
they're going to go out and they're going to use that stuff on the ground a lot of times before they want to use something that we've stored unless we use really palatable, high-quality hay. So availability of the hay is the, the big thing. How much, how much do they, they get? I don't know why I put exposure and availability both. Um, so I'm going to say exposure um, is that amount of hay, that amount of grain, that amount of calories that the, the horse is exposed to per day is going to impact on, on uh, intake. Quality. As quality goes up, intake goes up. As quality goes down, intake goes down. Full stop. The higher the quality of the hay, buy better hay, feed more of it, the more they're going to eat of it. And that falls with uh, palatability. You know, does it taste good? You know, I've been to dinner sometimes when I was really hungry, but I wasn't going to eat that crap because it didn't taste good. And the horse is not different. Um, so palatability can, can really impact uh, on in, intake of the, uh, of, of the hay. And anti-quality factors. By anti-quality factors, I mean molds, uh, mildew, uh, endophytes. Uh, there are a lot of, of factors in the hay that can reduce intact just because they impact on quality or they're toxic uh, to, to the horse. All right, so all of those affect. So again, going back, if you don't remember, but a few things. Buy immature hay if possible. You know, the, the earlier it is when it's cut, the better value you're going to get. What do you pay for hay up here? Don't give me this per bale thing either. Three ninety. One forty nine. Oh man, y'all are thieves. I've, I've, the cheapest I can get it in Kentucky is three hundred dollars a ton. But you know, there are lots of horses there. now on the racetrack. If you really want to look at highway robbery, look on the racetrack what they're getting for Western Timothy and, and Alfalfa. You know, sometimes twenty bucks a bale. More? It's highway robbery. Um, but at but any rate, well, I'm paying $300 a ton for, for my hay right now. And it's a mix of orchard grass and alf, alfalfa. At Three Chimneys, we're paying about 380 And that's western alfalfa and big bales, uh, which... Some, Chris Baker manages our farm there, and Chris is, is kind of a pioneer in forage, and I've taught him, I've worked with him since Ned Evans days, like 25 years, and big bales are better value, but they're pain to use, you know, and, and if it's not put up just right, the big flakes are hard to divide and so on, but uh, more and more of the farms are going to the big bales because it's significantly cheaper per ton. And try to buy your hay by the ton, you know. And I find that you probably are at a better position in terms of purchasing if you buy it in June or July instead of January or February, right. <laughs> you know, because they will take the opportunity to relieve you of some of your money in January. So, uh, buy better hay, feed more of it, uh, know that these horses... So, a thousand pound mare, uh, if she's eating 2% uh, per day of her body weight in hay, let's call it hay, not dry matter, so 20 pounds. If she's eating 3%, that's 30 pounds. How much does a bale of hay weigh? Kind of ambiguous question, isn't it? If they come to my house, they need to weigh about 50 or 60 pounds. They used to could weigh 100, but I can't lift what I used to. So you're talking about mares that are eating a minimum of a half a bale of hay per day. And a lot of times, do they get that? You know, they get this much, don't they? Morning and night in the stall, and which is far, far below what they can voluntarily consume which by definition means that we have to be feeding them significantly more concentrate. All right, so just remember, a horse really can eat a lot of hay. Uh, 
already did anti-quality factors. So what, what we want to do, kind of our base place to start from here is that we want to maximize the utilization of forage in our feeding program, in our nutrition program, either stored forage and or hay. I have, I have farms in California I work with, and they have this little animal called a snail dar uh, darter. And the, um, they've closed off a lot of the out, uh, irrigation because it's wrecking the habitat of these damn little old fish. Uh, and so consequently, some places that were irrigating pasture for horses, now the pastures are dead along with the almond trees and so on. So these horses are fed hay year round and, and grain. Do they do good? Yeah, they do good. I got guy, I used to show quarter horses and I got friends that, that show halter horses you know, those are those great big fat animals with small feet. Uh, they, they raise, they prep halter horses, which I used to do, on alfalfa, full stop. And if you do the math, it's really not missing much. You know, it might be a little low in trace minerals because alfalfa is so energy dense. So understand the, the energy requirements, the nutrient requirements. You can... I'm probably going to retire because of the internet, because there's so many internet uh, experts in nutrition. On the other hand, there is good information on the internet. If you, you can go to the National Research Council, you can go to a lot of different places and, and find the, the requirements that, that, you, that, that, that these animals have. Calculate hypothetical nutrient intake from the forage, and then make up the difference with feed or horse feed. And usually this means feeding significantly less feed than the bag says to feed, all right, to get it done. Be conservative. Don't not feed it. Horse feed is not, yes, question. With you mentioning what the bag says to feed, now, I'm sorry, if you read the back of the bag, yep. it's going to say to feed a seven month old full 12 pounds of grain a day. Mm-hmm. And when you speak with the nutritionists from the feed companies, they're going to say, well, if you feed less than that, then you need to supplement them because they're not going to get the right amount of vitamins and minerals. And so how do you address that? Good, good question. And I'll, I, I'm going to address that in the second part in depth. But just let me say that when I was a commercial nutritionist, and I still work for a couple of feed mills to formulate diets and so on because I need feed to feed the farms that are where they are. When I was a commercial nutritionist, the most difficult thing I had to do is write feeding instructions. Because I have no idea what that farm is like. And, and now I, somebody will call me, a big thoroughbred, how much should I feed my weanlings? Hell, I don't know. What are your pastures like? What's your hay feeding? What's your philosophy? Do you want them fat? Do you want them thin? Are you breed to race? Are you breed to sell? I mean, there's so many factors that impact on that. But, you know, a lot of times you'll see on the instruction feed a percent and a percent to a percent and a half of body weight per day in addition to good quality forage. And if you do the math, you're, you're feeding too much, basically. But it's a tough deal because... Sally Jo Dressage Queen over here may have one acre and no pasture uh, and need to feed a lot of feed. And somebody else over here has five acres per mare and her followers and good forage. And what you tell them is totally different. And that, that's why it's, it's difficult. They're not doing it to make you use more product. They're doing it to cover themselves in a wide range of forage conditions. And that's where you have to titrate in the dose a little bit in order to, to get an accurate number. 